two and a half hours lined up. We're going to um, engage with you. We're going to ask you to participate with us. We're going to ask you to really think about how do we move this industry forward? This industry has been absolutely decimated over the last 14 months. And at the current rate, it doesn't seem that there are any signs of it abating anytime soon. So we've got some really smart people in this room, well, in this virtual. And if you missed my name, my name is Sam Marshall. I'm the CEO of Social TV. We are corporate social. We are a corporate social investment uh, news platform, and our job is really to tell the South African, the African, and the global story of the work that corporates are doing in this space, and the amount of chias that you see people that have decided that even though the situation is dire, we're going to do our absolute best. So it's a privilege and an honor for me to virtually connect. I would have loved to be able to, to stare you in the face, to ask you for a cup of coffee, to network. But this is what the world is at uh, the moment, and this is how we've, uh, we, we, we learn to live with things. An exciting lineup. It's brought to you by Digify Africa in partnership with the African Management Institute. It is a virtual experience. Uh, before I unpack more of what we're going to expect, there are a couple of interesting things. I, I think you might have heard the music. Some of us were a little boogieing to, to, to the sounds, but we're going to try and create an immersive experience. And one of that is Safari Live. And this was recorded this morning. It's roughly about 10 minutes. So if you've forgotten what it feels like to be in the outdoors, to smell mother nature, to feel the sand under your feet, to just engage in that spirit of Ubuntu, this video is going to bring back painful memories, but enjoy. Afterwards, we'll talk about our lineup. We'll introduce you to some of our guests. We'll do an official welcome, and then we're going to get into the meat of it. We're gonna get stuck into it. And hopefully there will be some positive outcomes. Hopefully it'll get you to think, but more importantly, you're gonna ask us some tough questions and we've got the men and women that have the answers. So take a look at this. Yeah. Um, there it is. Good morning, everyone. And that side stripe jackal seems to be on a bit of a mission this morning we followed him actually all the way from the beginning of our airstrip here you can see it's quite an open area and we were just hoping he stayed on the road and didn't run off into the grass my name is dean and behind the camera we've got johan this morning and same as yesterday we've actually come to a bit of an open area looking for some cheetah um, and we found this side striped jackal running along this road here and then he crossed over our airstrip here he's heading towards there in the distance there's a couple impala rams and a lone wildebeest bull this was the area that the cheetah was seen yesterday and it's about this time that they might look to get moving. Oh, I think that jackal might have actually just run off. There's a crowned lapwing. They also, same as the side striped jackal, enjoy these open areas. Oh, I see the jackal still there, just on the edge of that thicket there. A little bit hard to see. I think he might have might have crossed off into the bush. percent Mike we really cool to see some cheetah this morning we did try yesterday but we weren't able to actually find them 
hoping this morning we'll have better luck. Oh, it looks like this little lapwing is looking to get some breakfast this morning. And if you have a look around the top of its head, you'll see, you'll notice that black band with a white stripe then on top of that and then another black bit on it. So quite a fitting name, the crowned lapwing. Oh, I'm just going to go a little bit more forward. It looks like that jackal's actually lied down. Just a little bit out of our reach from here. Lovely morning here. I think while we get closer to this jackal, you're going to head over to Pridelands with Stephen, who would love to say good morning. Good morning. Good morning, welcome to the dawn here at Katrina Islands. How are we all doing today? Good morning, welcome. My name is Steve, joined by Paul on camera, and we parked our car in the preparation for a walk, and we found some fresh female leopard tracks. So we are going to follow. Um, leopards here are not as relaxed as they are on the Swabby Sands, but we're going to see if we can make them. This beautiful lady, I'll show you the tracks as they come. We followed them around this copy. We had them on the other side there. Uh, we've come on one side, another side. Here we have the front foot, toes, walking, back pad as the front foot. Let me sorry, the back foot. Back foot, front foot, walking north down this road towards Marula Lane. So we're going to follow. Excited. I'm excited. Mpo, you ready? We're going to go for a little wonder. The cool thing about leopards is, as we've seen many times before, they like to walk on the roads. Not always, but for the most part, they like to walk on these tracks. We're going to just follow this track down and keep making a note of the tracks. And if we do lose them, we know where to come back to. Looks like she's being followed by some hyena. There was lots of hyena activity last night. There's hyena tracks around our camp. There was enormous amount of noise. They were fighting, they were swimming, they were splashing. They were having an absolute chaotic time around Lovu Dam. Uh, Sibu, you'll be joining me. I'm yeah, at the airstrip now. I've reached last position. I'm unable to relocate.
he's looking quite comfortable where he is. So he actually, he did stand up when the Zimpala ran across the airstrip there. beautiful brown snake eagle that we have found this morning on our way out you see how it is perched right on top of that dead tree just scanning sides to sides even though at the present moment looks like it's just facing one direction of course at that perch that's where that eagle will be hunting from trying to see the prey that are terrestrial, whether be it snakes or even some other reptiles for that matter that it can eat at least for, for the morning. Pretty much looks like predators here at this time of the day that they might be still on the hunt. A good morning and a warm welcome to all our viewers back home. I am Marcus. And I've got Odi on camera this morning. All right, yeah, like I mentioned, welcome to and beyond Gala in Kruger National Park. And I'm glad that our viewers can join us this morning for the beauties on wonders of this bush. As you see one of them on your screen there. Of course, I did mention a brown snake eagle. That looks like it's actually I've got the best view in the house when you do think about it. But of course, that is how this eagle will be doing its hunt this morning. Or even for the rest of this day for that matter. You know, we'll be looking for snakes that they can try and break their spines with his feet. I'm oh, sorry about that. So our plan for this morning also will be to head back to that area where we left those lions with their buffalo kill. I doubt much of that carcass will be left by this time. However, I think there is a possibility that we might still find them there, which will be a good thing. looking our direction now that eagle and you see how huge a head it's got compared to its body size yeah, i think for now let's rather leave this eagle to its day while we continue with ours and in the meantime we are going to send you over to tristan who would like to say morning to the viewers Wow, those visuals are absolutely fantastic, and that's courtesy of Safari Live. It was filmed this morning. Um, and you can see why the rest of the world is fascinated with South Africa and Africa, because of that rich, rich natural um, landscape, our diversity, our biodiversity, and just the fact that you can get that close to nature, it's fantastic. And there's something that Marcus said, and it resonated with me, um, something my wife said last night. Marcus described the brown eagle as a big, as a small head on that big body. And my wife sometimes accuses me of the same thing. So I thought that was quite interesting that um, I have so much in common with the brown eagle. But if you've just joined us, <laughs> if you've just joined us, uh, you are part of a discussion today, a very important discussion. And it's all about our theme of rebuilding SA's tourism and hospitality industry in a digital world. Now, we'll all agree 
that the last 14 months, not only in South Africa, but globally, has decimated industries. And today, through this interesting partnership and beautiful partnership, DeFi Africa and African Management Institute, they're going to take a look through our panel discussion, through our keynote speaker, on how do we rebuild the tourism industry? And are there innovative and new ways of engaging with the industry? And, you know, shocking results. If you, for example, and very, very quickly, if you Google, for example, tourism industry in South Africa, you're going to find 4,130,000 results. It's going to take you roughly around 37 seconds. But the first headlines to hit you from France 24, South Africa tourism on edge with double impact of virus and riots. Obviously, it would be remiss of us not to, during the course of this afternoon, to reflect the impact of the recent riots. We now know officially that the president and the Department of Defense and Intelligence is calling it an insurrection. And we'll have a talk about that. News 24, riots put brand essay at risk, create death now as international tourists, tourists plan for peak season. Another headline, um, we need to work together if you want to revive South Africa's tourism industry. That's biz community. Uh, Money Web put out uh, another headline. Tier support is a must for struggling tourism sector right now. So really, we can see that the media industry is also reflected on the tourism industry. And this is such an apt conversation at the moment. But the person to welcome you officially and to give you a warm welcome and to set the tone before we dive into our keynote from Asisa and Shona, who, um, as I understand, has just recently left um, his post as CEO of tourism. But we'll have a chat to him. Love listening. Love listening to Cesar. Fascinating, fascinating insights. But let me official, officially welcome in a warm South African, and also I am from the Western Cape, so Ekan Afrikaans proud. So I want to welcome Namonde Konteka Siopa, who is, and I just want to pull up a bio very quickly. Um, she, Ms. Namonde Siopa, has recently been appointed by Facebook as head of public policy, South Africa region, and is part of a wider Africa public policy team. She's the former counselor at the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, ICASA, which regulates the telecommunications, broadcasting, and personal services sector. We're not going to ask her about why SABC wants us to pay our, 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 our TV licenses. She's well past that. Um, and But she possesses over 28 years of experience in the broader media sector. So wherever you are, in your lounge, in your kitchen, in your fancy business office at home, please put your hands together. We saw some videos, make some noise, scream at your family, but please welcome Ms. Namonde. Thank you, thank you so very much, Sam, for the warm welcoming South Africa, you know, how we do things um, here at home. Yes, my name is Nomonde Konaga Suopa, and a very good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the Rebuilding South Africa's Tourism, Hospitality Industry in the Digital World. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for granting us as Facebook this opportunity to share our impartations on the strategies that we have put in place in our support to help rebuild South Africa's once thriving tourism sector. As Facebook, we have actually adopted a three pillar approach in our response to our support for the tourism and hospitality industries, namely investment, support and impact. With regards to investment, Facebook cares about Africa, South Africa included, and is invested in genuinely supporting communities across the continent, namely startups, SM SMEs, developers, creatives, NGOs, to name but a few. We are constantly connecting, listening, and learning. With support, as Facebook, we undertake a number of expert training and events with partners across Sub-Sahara Africa with the aim of equipping individuals and businesses with digital skills to grow. 
on impact. Our goal is to drive positive social and economic impact across the continent by driving innovation, supporting Africa's tech entrepreneurship ecosystem, training communities and the next generation of leaders to better understand and utilize the power of digital tools for economic growth. Understanding the market. Facebook's mission is very clear, to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. Our mission in Africa is no different. We understand the importance of being local in a global world, and we want to have a long-term long impact. Our goals as Facebook are aligned with government priorities. In our efforts to support our government, as Facebook, we have aligned our plans with the South African government priorities. As part of the 2021 priorities, the South African government identifies accelerating economic recovery and creating sustainable jobs to drive inclusive growth as key. And as such, reviving the tourism sector has been identified as, a crucial, as crucial to economic recovery. Additionally, the Ministry of Tourism has also identified technology as a key enabler to achieving its five-year strategic plan of more than doubling international tourist arrivals to 21 million by 2030. We know that businesses, and especially small businesses in the tourism space, have been greatly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it, is, it has become increasingly important for them to consider ways to keep afloat. Next, I would like to outline how we, as Facebook, support small businesses. Millions of people come to Facebook every day to connect with their friends, family, communities, and causes that matter to them most. As I have mentioned before, our mission is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And what better way to do that than helping people experience new places and creating new experiences via tourism. Accordingly, our mission is to ensure that people are informed and are kept safe. We also have a business resilience resource hub to help small businesses to navigate these trying periods. We further support the digitization, digitization of African SMEs. Globally, over a billion people on Facebook are connected to a small business. And as such, Facebook enables SMEs to scale. Our platform enables small businesses in Africa, South Africa included, to have a digital presence to ensure that they're able to connect with their customers, share their stories, build their brands, and, ulti and ultimately increase their sales. We know that small businesses are the backbone of the economy and that digital platforms can be a powerful tool to help them reach their business goals. Therefore, we have created programs that could help local businesses while also helping to drive economic growth across the continent. Now, I would like to talk about the programs that we as Facebook have in South Africa, right here in Mzansi. We have two flagship economic impact programs that we implement here in South Africa, namely Boost with Facebook and Digify Pro. Through Boost with Facebook, we have partnered with Digify Africa to offer a series of Boost with Facebook sessions targeting tourism and hospitality industry. To date, in South Africa, we have trained almost 10,000 business owners via these two programs. The Digify program 
is a program that we have implemented in partnership with Digify Africa, running in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya. Graduating 100% of all participants with over 70% finding employment in agencies, while others opting to start their own business ventures. This is a two month bootcamp that prepares aspiring digital marketers for jobs in the industry. The bootcamp teaches the participants about the full spectrum of digital marketing and gives them the exposure to the industry via weekly live briefs with agencies or brand partners. Boost with Facebook is a series of virtual webinars that we offer small business owners an opportunity to learn more about how digital tools can be used as a tool for business growth while also making meaningful connections with potential consumers. Whether it's setting up a Facebook page, finding your audience online, or increasing engaging content, these free workshops help thousands of entrepreneurs develop their social media skills and unlock new audiences. We as Facebook believe that these programs will help small businesses at this time with the relevant digital skills to reimagine their businesses. Additionally, there is a considerable shift to online connection and commerce acceleration. People are spending more and more time online, especially true when we cannot get together in person. And as such, businesses need to be online too. Before the COVID-19 crisis hit, one in three companies did not have a website. Now, people are looking for businesses on Facebook and Instagram more than usual during this crisis. So our free products are particularly important to the many brick and mortar businesses pivoting quickly online. A Facebook page or Instagram business profile is free and in a matter of minutes establishes a digital storefront. The Unlocking Africa's Potential Study reports that in South Africa, 53% of SMMEs said social media and online messages help them to operate remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, businesses, especially small businesses in the tourism sector are struggling to weather the storm. According to the Department of Tourism Annual Performance Plan, year 2021 to year 2024, 92% of the tourism businesses surveyed locally in October 2020 reported a more than 50% decline in revenues compared to October 2019, and 36% of businesses indicated a total loss of revenue. The Global State of Small Business Research with OECD and the World Bank paint a sobering picture, indicating that a considerable portion of SMMEs have cited year-on-year -year decline in sales and a third have reduced employment. With more people spending time on our products and services than ever before, we are focused on continuing to provide digital skills, training to help more businesses grow and adopt. Accordingly, Boost with Facebook has helped small businesses so far to pivot to online by showing them how to create a mobile presence or digital storefront through pages and business profiles. It has helped them to build a community just like passing out flyers or a word of mouth digitally. Leverage Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp to reach new customers and continue operating. With that said, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share about the work that we are doing as Facebook in supporting businesses, SMMEs, and as such, the tourism and hospitality industry. 
Thank you, and over to you, Sam. Wow, Namunde, you've given us so much to uh, unpack. And when we have the panel discussion, we are definitely going to, going to unpack some of those numbers, look at some of the programs, the fact that you've already been able to affect more than 10,000 SMMEs with this program, the fact that we've seen the scale of and the opportunities that exist within the digital space. And I'm very happy that um, Facebook is talking to government about how do we accelerate, how do we do job creation. So for me, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for those insights and for those warm, that warm welcome. I don't want to show you, but I'm sitting with my cup of coffee here. I'm cheering you as you <laughs> as you as you're talking to us. Um, so that's that's the the first part of our session. We are of course stretching across um, uh, the next two. Well, there's about two hours left. But the something that Namonda mentioned that I do want to highlight is that there will be a ton of resources available at the end of the session. And you will be, and you heard that magical word. Now, if you're anything like me, you will love the word free. Um, so there will be a ton of resources that will be available post this conversation that you will be able to access. You will be able to find out more about our Facebook programs. You will be able to go and read more about the uh, flagship interventions, and you will be able to engage and become tech savvy. Now, we are fast running out of time. We're here till about 4.30, so I do want to move along. Namonde, once again, thank you very much. Our next keynote speaker is somebody that I, I don't even want to introduce, to be honest, because he is he's that popular. Um, he, he says incredibly popular. I mean, I've had the privilege um, and many people have had the privilege of listening and getting some deep insights. But he his term ran until somewhere towards the end of the year and is no longer part of um, um, tourism um, South Africa, but that's a, a recent past. But the insights and that understanding of tourism, um, I'm not sure, but I think CISA eats it, sleeps it, dreams with it. I think he's divorced his partner and he lives with tourism. So I look forward to getting a sense from CISA as the keynote speaker. Then we'll go into our panel discussion and we'll unpack some of those issues. But CISA, over to you. Uh, I'm looking forward. I've got, you can't see it, but I've got my Sami, I've got my popcorn, I've got my pad. I'm ready to make, to, to take some notes. Awesome. Um... Yeah, how do I uh, meet that expectation? Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you very much for, for having me on board. You know, uh, one notices that, geez, one is getting older when you start to becoming called former of things. You know, I'm the former CEO of SA Tourism, and I also have the honor of being the former chairman of Digify Africa as well. You know, so yes. there's, a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole lot of things of being a former, and all is one. Uh, tries not to stay for too long until they, they become a bit uh, missing that side. But anyway, thank you very much, I think, for the conversation. Um, it's, 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 it's really apt, and the engagement levels are really, really appropriate for where South Africa finds itself. Uh, I have no long presentation that I'm going to do, but hopefully I'm just going to give you a bit of a sense of a couple of points that are top of mind, and that would possibly form the basis of uh, the panel conversation that we can have afterwards. So if I can take you a little bit back, um, you know, to the days of what I call pre-COVID, you know, um, you know, Nomonde mentioned, you know, part of the ambition is to double the number of arrivals by 2030. Uh, tourism is part and parcel of the National Development Plan. It is one of the sectors that we're looking for as a country to say, let's pull this lever up. It employs people, et cetera, et cetera. We had 10.5 million internet I mean, arrivals uh, in 2019, as it were. And we are really on the back of a trajectory to really get that up and running. Tourism is a sector that's been growing year and year in this country, but it's been floating subliminally just below the surface. And we wanted to elevate this up, you know, quite substantially. We all know what really happened, you know, essentially in um, January, February, March, you know, when, uh, you know, things started really to heat up quite substantially. And uh, it's been quite, difficult ever since to kind of find a way back to where we're at. I'm very happy that this conversation is not called the typical recovery, but rather rebuilding. 
because recovery tends to mean that we want to return things to ways of old. And that's something we've got to be very careful about, not to return to ways of old. It essentially making sure that we can drive things and, and, and open up tourism on the other side, much better, much stronger, much more focused. Um, tourism is one of those few, few sectors that actually have what I call a butterfly effect. I have an open challenge out there to all my friends in banking and various industries to say, show me an industry and I'll show you how tourism uh, contributes to it. And uh, it's one of those spaces that people realize they're in tourism only when tourism stops. You know, uh, the big shopping centers with all of their, uh, you know, very expensive stores start to realize actually that they need tourists. They've relied historically on tourists to actually go to the shopping centers and do the spending, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing. When someone overseas comes to Diamond Walk in Santon City and splurges for 200,000 rands, 100,000 rands, that activity is not recorded as tourism, but rather as retail, right? When Sun City hosts the Nedbank Golf Challenge, you know, weekend as an example, and they crack literally something like 85,000 eggs a day. That activity of those eggs is recorded as agriculture, not as tourism. So I'm giving you a bit of a sense then in terms of how the ecosystem starts to kind of flow together. Um, tourism is great for a couple of things. One is what I call a forex earner. That's ultimately the, the, the reason for its existence. It is all about saying that in the South African economy, we've got a finite number of people. We know we've got high unemployment levels. We know that there's pressure basically on uh, disposable income. Part of the cure is to say, how then do I get people from outside who've got money to spend in this economy? Right, beautiful proposition. So if we don't have the money ourselves, invite others who have the money to spend. They spend it at um, you know, various places. They spend it at the hotels. They spend their food, they spend their shopping centers. They'll spend it car hires, as an example. You know, so I was telling someone yesterday that the car, the, the, the motor manufacturers also probably didn't see themselves in tourism. Guess what happens? The car hire industry refleets itself every June of every year. For the last two years, they've not been changing their fleets. And that's been having an impact then on the production of vehicles. So it's really kind of a really uh, knitted space. So ultimately, what are we looking for? We're looking for people to come here. We're looking for them to spend. We're looking for them as well to bring the foreign money so that the economy, we show up our revenues as, as a country as it were. Now, digitization is important. I am right up there from that perspective. It is important because it does a couple of things. It becomes an enabler as Namonde said, a beautiful, beautiful enabler. Because now a small mom and pop lodge in rural KZN can now be visible to a tourist somewhere in Germany, in France, in, in Zimbabwe, in Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera. Where previously they didn't have the platform. You needed gazillions of rands in marketing spend to get your name and everything out there. The challenge, which I wish could be part of the conversation, is how do you monetize this? I mean, we saw a video right now, which is great, uh, you know, that showed uh, Kruger and uh, it showed, you know, the activities. You even uh, compared yourself to the bird, I forgot what it's called, the head and everything else there. Um, the question that I always put, however, how do you monetize that, right? How do you monetize? You create the excitement, that's great. But remember, at the end of the day, we said tourism is about making sure that people spend money. Now, if someone in New York is going to be watching that video over there, how do we make sure we get revenue in there? And I'm talking about the butterfly effect as well. How do restaurants get a piece of the action? How does the crafter, you know, that will sell their way also get a piece of the action? How does, you know, in the entire ecosystem, how does the bakery and everything else there and that in itself is something that we have to scratch our heads around. Uh, whilst, you know, uh, technology is great, but it must not substitute the entire or the bigger impact, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of, of tourist traveling. The other part is we look at leisure tourism, but also more importantly, is also what you call um, business tourism, right? And these are the conferencing, uh, the exhibitions, uh, the international conferences. To give you a bit of an example, 
a typical size of a conference that we can get is anything between say 10, 15,000 delegates that come to Cape Town ICC that has just doubled its capacity for three or four days. You can then imagine what that does for that entire ecosystem. You can imagine what that does for the number of beds, for the flights that come in, you know, and, 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 and for the goodie bags, for the coffees, the entire ecosystem. You remove that and you start to see now, geez, you've left quite a big gap from the perspective. So all of this then kind of says, how then do we start to, to, to bring that in? Now we live in a world where we are Zooming, we're not meeting, we're meeting virtually. Again, you lose out on some of the substance and the triple down that is kind of sitting over there. But you know what? I think there is solutions to it, but it's something to actually put forward from the perspective. Um, I was in Kruger about two days ago uh, on, on, on a work trip basically over there. Now, at this time of the year, Kruger is usually bustling, it's packed. I was this Kupuza side, zero. There's actually very, very few visitors there. Now, two things to be aware of. One is that we are in school holiday period. You will think that it should be full in there. Secondly as well, August is when typically um, Euro, Europe takes holiday. They then would kind of descend down on Kruger. That ain't happening this year, you know? And that's the real travesty that we're starting to see in the sector that is kind of uh, putting a lot of pressure basically from the perspective. Now, let's just talk then about looking forward. How then are we gonna get ourselves out of it? What is clear, however, is that um, a plan has been put in place and we are very good at plans in South Africa. There's no shortage of strategies. So please uh, um, bear with me a bit on this one, right? But a recovery plan for tourism has been put together. And it really sits on a couple of three kind of real legs, if I can call it that one. The first leg is protecting the supply side, right? And it basically says, whilst during this period, the tourism is not allowed to operate, we've got to make sure that as a country, we protect our tourism assets so that when things open up, we have a sector to speak of. You don't want the sector to deteriorate that there's nothing to speak about or rather to sell. To give you some examples, we've already seen some impacts of these, especially around the public owned establishments. I'm looking to talk about the museums. They are part of the museum. Lilla's Leaf Museum, as an example, is one of them. You're starting to see even the Nelson Mandela House in Villacata Street, they're closing, right? And you are worried now that we cannot let these iconic destinations, these iconic uh, experiences go, you know, uh, aground because when things open up, we've got to make sure that they're in place. We've got to make sure that the smaller operators, the moms and pubs that operate lodges, et cetera, et cetera, are also contained and not uh, and protected as it were, right? And you're doing all of this, by the way, in a very tight fiscal environment. Government just doesn't have the money anymore. So therefore, how then does it make these very, very difficult um, decisions? The other one is what we call reigniting demand. And this is making sure then we start to drive and make sure that South Africa is not forgotten as a tourism destination, even though people may not be ready to travel uh, you know, at this particular point in time. Um, just before, you know, during my tenure I left as a tourism, we did, we did something that we've never done before. That is actually the opposite of what we usually do. We actually ran adverts globally and told people not to come to South Africa. Now you can imagine how difficult that was, you know, from, a, from an entity that usually just attracts people to say, no, no, don't come. When the time is right, we'll start to come to you on that side. Then. Now, this recovery is going to be led inside out. It's going to start with domestic then regional, then ultimate international. And it all goes about how the consumer behavior is changing, that people are actually very cautious about traveling. They start to explore the immediate circles and the more confident they get, it gets wider and wider and wider. And confidence comes in different levels. It comes basically knowing that a destination has certain protocols in place. It comes being vaccinated that could give some sort of confidence you know, uh, you know, that environment. But for the foreseeable future, our bread and as a sector is domestic. And we've always shunned domestic, not looked at it. And here now is an opportunity to say, how do you reconfigure ourselves and restack this tourism pie to make sure that we're not too reliant on international, but we've got covered it. We also need to look at the African continent as a market. We tend to speak overseas to jump outside 
you know, into Europe, into um, the US, into the East as well. And to say there is a market on the African continent. We've got to look at it. We've got to put solutions and product together and make sure that we can deliver it. The third pillar is for government to create an enabling environment. You need an all of government approach for tourism to happen and happen properly. Here's what I mean by that part, is that you need the Minister of Safety and Security Police to do their job and make sure our tourists feel safe in this country. We need the Department of, of Home Affairs to make sure that our immigration policies are aligned and are user friendly in order to attract people in. That a visa in South Africa does not take two weeks and it's a manual process, but can be automated and seamless. That we remove obstacles like the unabridged certificates that were required. You know, literally, the policy was put together with the South African lens in mind, but no one looked at the other side and said, well, how are the people that are coming to the country going to be receiving this, right? We need to also make sure the Department of Transport, Transport Minister, does issue licenses so that more airlines can fly to South Africa. And, and, and we, we, I just saw a, a, a warning right now um, from ESCOM that uh, they are under pressure right now and may possibly go into load shedding, you know, we need ESCOM to work so that the experience that tourists have in this country is positive. You don't want to be in an environment where there's no energy. So you need an all of government approach. And those are some of the things that actually pull it together on that side. So those are kind of roughly the three things and we can speak a bit more on that side. Now, you mentioned earlier on Sam, around uh, the riots as well. And we've got to look at something that's called the brand equity of a country. Now, before you sell your destination in Pochopstrom or in the Wild Coast or even Cape Town, you got to sell South Africa first. And if the image of South Africa is not positive, it's got a negative effect on what actually happens down there. Brand equity is important. Now, let me say in the upset that riots are not unique to South Africa, but we are placed at a much higher premium than other destinations. Look at a country like France. I remember not so long ago, there were riots there, right? The main Champs-Élysées with that whole parade basically over there was in turmoil. All the shops had barricaded. It was literally a cut and paste of what we saw in South Africa, literally. We saw what happened in the US with the whole Black Lives Matter movement and everything around that side. But we get judged differently. Now we can sit back and bemoan it or to actually say, no, it is what it is. Our brand is much, much more fragile than any other brand. When a tourist gets mugged in South Africa, it makes international news. When a tourist gets mugged in Paris, it doesn't make that kind of impact there. So we've got to be very careful that we've got a very fragile brand and we've got to do our best to actually protect it, communicate it, and make sure that we can actually come through on the other side. Let me talk also about pricing. Now that I've spoken about how domestic now is going to be the, the feature, and start to look everywhere else. You start to hear a lot of things around pricing. South African pricing is too high. I don't know how many calls I've got. CISA, do something uh, around your pricing and everything else there. What's important to know that, you know, we are a free market economy in South Africa. So if the marshals decide to actually invest in a lodge, um, they can charge whatever it is that they want to charge. Absolutely. However, the market forces come into play, the laws of supply and demand. If the pricing is too high, no one will come and they will effectively be out of business. However, if the price point that they decide to sit on and there are people who are willing and able to come there, they will not reduce their price. They profit maximizers, essentially. And that's the reality that we have to look at. We live in a very un unequal country. In fact, we've got the world's highest uh, Gini coefficient. But however, we've got a very, very top few, right, who have a lot of money. When you start to call some of these lodges at 50,000 rand, 60,000, 80,000 rand, you say, no, we're fully booked. You know, now my view, the pressure usually comes in to say, no, you must introduce local pricing. There must be, you know, um, international pricing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a different view. I'm a free market here at heart. But I also believe in terms of technology where you use what I call dynamic pricing, right? It is the exact same a system that an airline seat from Joburg to Cape Town costs different amounts based on the time of day that you're actually flying to. 
So if you want to go to Cape Town Monday morning, the early bird, you're going to be competing for that seat with business, with corporate. You're going to pay much more. But if you travel on a Wednesday with the pensioners, again, you'll be a much, much softer. So therefore, you make an informed decision based on what it is you're willing to pay. So therefore, it's still the same trip, but however, different time. So we've got something, I think there's a thing to be done around technology that gives transparency in there so I can choose that now nah, I'm not going to go to that hotel on a Friday because it's just too much, it's 80,000. But if I go on a Tuesday, right, it'll be 5,000 as an example. And I think these are just some of the things that we kind of need to get into play. So that pricing point. But that said, however, it shows us that there's actually a big market that is underserved in South Africa. <laughs> and instead of forcing those that are existing to pull down their pricing, I would advocate for new engines to come in and close that gap, come in and, and hit that price point that your observe is missing, as opposed to pulling those existing. Those that are existing have a market that they're serving. Let them do what they do best. But let's bring in the space that actually targets and starts to focus on those particular spaces. And I think those are just some of the things that we look at. We cannot only look at us as consumers, but also as well, we've got to look at ourselves as participants in the sector. When we open up, I would like to make sure that we bring in as much of South Africa as possible into the fore. We are more than just Table Mountain, Garden Route, and Kruger. Because typically that's how we profile the country. And many people think if they hit those three landmarks, well, they've seen all of South Africa. There is the inner belly, there is the culture, there is the people, there is the food, the flavors. We've got to bring all of that in. And you've got to think of this like almost like a, like a, a supermarket. The more products you have on the shelf and the more varied they are, the more you can entice people to come in, come back over and over and over again. So even if you come to the country for the fifth time, there's still things to do, you know, that are, are different, et cetera. The consumer behavior is changing on a daily basis. Immersion is becoming central to it. People don't travel for a bit, they travel for experiences, experiences that touch them, that actually invoke emotions and everything else from, from their perspective. So to me, it's about this hardware that you have, you bring in this technology, and I think you've got a, you've got a, a winning formula there. Then lastly, before I close off, you know, we really have to get the basics right. It's almost like the ticket to the party. And one of them is vaccination, right? Um, it doesn't matter what we feel about vaccination. It's irrelevant. But believe you me, vaccinated countries or, or, or countries that have a, the population vaccinated at a much higher level have a far better opportunity to actually attract people to fly over there. It's a, safe, it's a state of security. They feel more comfortable that the population, that the space I'm going to does not offer higher risk than the space that I come from. You cannot get rid of risk, but you can mitigate it. So I'm encouraged to see that we are ramping up our vaccination. Um, you know, the, I believe the 35s to 49s, uh, clearly not my group, I'm much younger than that. But, uh, for my group is really pulling the charts. But I think there exist opportunities, you know, lastly, to make sure then that we get ourselves vaccinated so that we can put our front foot forward, that when the time is right, when things come right, we are ready as an economy. And we can get that employment happening again. We can get that balance of payments happening again. We can get all of those people, again, bringing their heart and money outside to spend in here and helping our economy to grow. So with that, I'd just like to leave it basically over there for now. And uh, I'm happy to pick up any conversation points as we go down the line. And I hope I've kind of given you a bit of a sense and not scared you too much about the, the, the space. I mean, I've been in many sectors before, but I can tell you right now that um, tourism sector is one that's very close to my heart. It's something that is very addictive. It's fun, but at the same time, it's very much a developmental. And it's about exposing who we are as a nation to the world. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, sir. Cesar, uh, thank you very much for that uh, in-depth understanding experience of the industry. And some critical pointers that we've got in reaction to is the dynamic pricing. But the journalist in me wants to ask you one or two questions before we go to the panel discussion, because you have just vacated that position. I mean, it's so, it's so fresh that I'm sure they can still smell you in the building. Um, 
talk to me very, very quickly, and, and I'm going to touch on some of the aspects that you've mentioned, getting the basics right, um, looking at how we um, look at that model of tourism, starting with domestic, then going regional, and then going international. So with our panelists, we'll unpack that. But you've just left a position that you've said for the first time we've run ads. I'm telling people that when the time is right, come. Just in, in, in terms of your tenure, what did you do right? And what do you think you're leaving big gaps? Because um, loads of people are going to reflect on your time um, in, to, in SA tourism. And they're going to say, but some of these things that you have mentioned and highlighted could have been addressed. I know the, the, the environment has been incredibly tough. I mean, you would have to be, you would have to be living under a rock to not see that the environment is incredibly tough. But just very quickly reflecting for, for, for all of us on your time as the CEO, what did you do right? And what do you think you could have done better? Sure. Uh, where do I start? Uh, I had an Afro when I started the role. Look at me. I've got no hair now. Um, look, a, a couple of things. I mean, certain things you, you absolutely cannot plan for. And, uh, you know, my tenure there was just bits and pieces of what I call pandemics that are hitting us all the time. I joined at the back of Ebola, right? And Ebola was actually isolated to West Africa. But uh, the world decided that all of Africa has got Ebola. So people didn't travel to, to the continent. And then we recovered nicely from that one. And then we had the Cape Town fires, as an example. Um, no, no, sorry, the Nisner fires, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that also had a bit of a, dis a devastation. And again, people see this, you know, um, images, but they assume the whole country's on fire. Then we had the Cape Town drought, and I had to become a, a, a water expert overnight, essentially. And, and, and essentially, it was about educating, informing the world that issues of climate change are not unique to South Africa. It's a global phenomenon. Secondly, as well, is that we are now putting the playbook together that the world will follow. You know? So instead of looking at South Africa as a victim, look at how we can all get together to make sure that we can make traveling sustainable and making sure as well that we start to spread the word as to how these things are done. Right? And then obviously, ultimately, hitting, hitting on the pandemic itself. Now, this is the most challenging one, as I said, we had to really become a brand that is actually awake, that can read the room. There is absolutely no ways for us to say, come to South Africa, guys, we are safe, et cetera, et cetera. Because I said, the world is in trouble right now. Let's all stay home, let's be safe. And at the right time, we can come through basically from the perspective. The inclusion of new players is so, so important because if we just snooker ourselves, in those four or five things to do in South Africa, that's it. Then we just, you know, a burnout can be much, much shorter, but bringing new products in. And I saw my good friend here, Opa, who's one of the speakers. I mean, he's got a brilliant product. He's invested all of his money, I know, into that product to make sure that the experience is there and everything else there. We want more investment into the sector so that we can start enjoying ourselves as well. It also builds a lot of camaraderie so that South Africans can get to know their own country. We don't travel our country very well ourselves, but the movement, the ability to go to different places, food, flavors, uh, the topography, the weather is different and everything else is important as well. So it is these building blocks that we kind of put together to make sure that we can serve back to the environment. Then lastly, you've dealt now with the customer. You've got to deal with the industry itself. That's a difficult one. How do you bring hope? to an industry where you yourself don't know the answers. When you yourself don't have the you know, magic ball to say, listen guys, this is only for 21 days as we were originally told, now it's three months. No, now it's for six months. Geez, we are two years in now. Suddenly it could be a three, four, five year thing. You know? But you've got to continuously communicate. Even if you're communicating, say, I don't know, it's okay. What people look for is hope. They know what to do. If they feel they are led, if they feel there is transparency, you'll see people coming to the fore. And I think those are just one of the big things that we did quite substantially. I've never participated in so many webinars in my life as the last two years, but we had to do that to make sure that we continuously communicate, communicate, communicate. Thank you. I'm gonna ask you a final question. And just as you're talking, we're getting a ton of comments. And I know that I've got a panel discussion and I, and I want to be fair to the, to the other panelists, but I, while we have you, 
You talked about the effect and the fragility of the um, SA uh, tourism um, space, the way we are seen, how we are compared to the rest of the world, and you use France as an example. But the issue around, and using your example of a mugging, is not just a, a horrible story globally, it's a terrible sto story within our own borders. There are South Africans that are keen to travel. I mean, you would have seen, you know the numbers better than I do, and I'm sure a lot of the members here as well, that with the borders being closed to international tourists, we in actual fact did see South Africans go and visit their local, um, the local hotels, go to the local destinations and use that as an option. But South Africans are scared of muggings, crime. They are scared of, there's just so much that you can experience in a township. And yet the stigma now around townships, I don't know how long it will last. How do we deal, and this is to, I think it's Ramone uh, Madika Singh's um, point is, how do we deal, first of all, with the, with the idea or the, the, this inherent fear that we have? And second of all, how do we find a balance between exposing the cultural aspects of South Africa? How do we? Yeah, we, we do live in very interesting times, as it were. You know, um, as I said, driving back from Mpumalanga, I've never cherished taxi drivers like I do now in my life. I greet them. You know, if they cut me, like, I'm like, hey, you're okay, <laughs> essentially. And that kind of gives you a bit of a sense that, you know, we're, we, we are at our best when our, when our back's against the wall uh, as a country. And I think it's... It's a very strange phenomenon that we have. You know, we almost need to be literally right on our back foot and you'll see the best of us uh, coming through. And uh, you start to see now this revolution sweeping through about how we can be together as it were and start to rebuild uh, the South Africa that we all cherish and that we want. But you're absolutely right. Our brand is very fragile. And, um, you, you know, when you speak about safety, uh, we did a survey once that the interesting thing was that many people were not scared of being mugged whilst traveling. They were actually scared of leaving their houses uh, uh, um, uh, empty whilst they were traveling, you know, uh, because they will be burgled, you know, whilst they were traveling elsewhere. So again, it's the psychological element of security and safety that we have to get right, you know, from a perspective there. You are absolutely right. South Africans have been phenomenal. What we saw is those that used to travel overseas now did inward. They started discovering new parts of this country. If I had my own way, uh, Sam, I would declare every week a long weekend because I don't know what happens on long weekends. We just simply go out on leisure. And to kind of give you a bit of a sense is that all those places that are non-urban, right? Anything with the bush, anything with the beach or a mountain has been doing phenomenally well, especially over weekends, we get out. The real pain is this inner belly of the city center hotels, right? Uh, that are typically patronized by um, corporates and government and compensants, which are not happening at all. Those are really struggling, those city center hotels. But anything on the outskirts is really doing well, especially on, um, on, on weekends there as well. So as then we knit ourselves together again, there lies opportunities to understand, you know what, you've, this, this time has allowed us to showcase what we can do to South Africans themselves on both sides. You've made South Africans look inward. You've made the industry also value South Africans and say, listen, how do I reconfigure myself so that I can be this market? Because for right now, that's the only market I'm able to serve. And I think those are the things that you're starting to see coming through. Cesar, thank you very much for your time. I know we've kept you a little bit longer than uh, expected, but as I've said, I always enjoy listening to you. And hopefully you, you, you'll still have a voice within the tourism industry. I know media guys like us, we, we love having chats to people that are insightful and, and think out of the box. I am going to allow the panelists to just weigh in on some of the stuff that you said as part of the discussion, but thank you very much. And it is that time of our conversation, if you look at our agenda, that we are going to have a panel discussion now. And we've got some really insightful, insightful people. And I, I'm going to ask them to just react immediately to um, CISA's input. 
to also, if there was a talking point around um, um, some of the, the elements that uh, Namonde put forward, I think that could also make for some uh, an engaging conversation. But of course, the theme for this part of our, our conversation today is really rebuilding SA's tourism and hospitality industry. And to Cesar's point, right at the beginning of his presentation was that he was happy that we were using the word rebuilding. Um, so my panelists are in no particular order. They're all very, very important. Um, it's just the way I copied and pasted them on my, on my, on my page. Uh, it's Ilse van Skalkwijk. Uh, Ilse van Skalkwijk is a development economist who resides and works in the Western Cape. She holds a master's degree in public development management. Ilse has worked in both private and public sector as a development economist with over 16 years of experience. To be honest, I don't have five hours to read her bio. Um, none of them, actual fact. I was given at least on each of them 10 pages and I had to put it in one paragraph. So if I am offending them, um, I, I do apologize. We just don't have enough time to read their full bias. But she currently holds the position of Chief Director for Economic Sector Support at the Western Cape Provincial Department of Economic Development and Tourism. So should have some nice insights. Um, then as Sisa mentioned, one of our panelists is Opa Pilani, who is a self-made entrepreneur tourism development consultant, local government specialist, business coach, and he's a preacher. Um, you know how we feel about, we love our preachers uh, in this country. And he's also a media advisor and provides uh, beneficial strategic planning and planning advice for integrated development planning. Then we've got Lebo Pasha. Um, he is a seasoned finance and investment professional with extensive senior management and board experience in industrial manufacturing space with direct exposure to value change in, uh, chains in energy, mining, marine engineering, infrastructure, transportation, heavy engineering, and defense, oil and gas. And he's from the African Management Institute. Uh, last but certainly not least, an incredibly elo eloquent speaker. I'm sure that uh, you'll be as spellbound as I am um, every time she speaks is Paka Mile Slazu, who is the award-winning founder of two travel brands, Zulu Nomad and In Africa Travel. She's also the co-chair of the SATSA Access, Inclusivity and Diversity Committee, previously the SATSA Transformation Committee. Um, and she's also a seasoned strategist and hands-on operational lead with a vast experience in implementation of strategic change initiatives in Africa. And that really is our, our panelists. Also, just quickly, uh, I just saw a message flash a little bit earlier that they're, you know, the cool thing about these things are that we give away prizes. So Facebook, I'm very impressed with Facebook. They're giving, they're giving away five $100, not rands, $100 vouchers um, to their training program. So it really is all about participation. The more active you are, the more bombard you, the more you bombard us with questions, um, you're going to get a hundred dollar voucher. And and if you're like me, you'll wait for the exchange rates to be at the right peak before you uh, you engage with Facebook around the value. So we are also then going to refer to some of the interactions and the questions that we are receiving from our, uh, our participants, and we will throw them in um, as we go through this this conversation. But I think because of where we find ourselves, I'm going to, if the gentlemen don't mind, I'm going to start with the ladies. Um, Pakamile, immediately a reaction to just um, some of Cesar's insights and his thoughts. I was going to ask him a ton of harder questions around the, the role of SA tourism um, and, 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 and him leaving early, but that's a conversation for another day. Just your reaction, Pakamile, to some of the, the insights and some of the stuff that he mentioned. Absolutely, Sam. Um, thank you very much um, to the Digify team and AMI Africa for having me here today. I mean, um, I think Sisa has said, has said so, so much in terms of really the macro issues, the big picture stuff. Um, and I think the challenge for a lot of SMMEs 
um, and this is even before COVID, is that at the end of the day, this is, it's more words, right? It's more words. What does this actually mean for me and my business as a small business owner? And I'm not talking about the business owner who has had success in the tourism industry before because they were targeting the international market. I'm talking about the young people coming out of universities, coming out of these colleges who studied hospitality and tourism and have no idea how to actually turn these skills and their lessons into um, sustainable businesses. So I think overall, and, and Sisa mentioned as well, we're very good at planning as a country. So we've got great plans, we've got great policies. However, when it comes to how these actually translate to creating opportunities for young people in our economy, to creating jobs for young people in our economy, that is really still missing. And, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to get into a little bit of that in the rest of the discussion. Ilsa, uh, a reaction from you to uh, Cesar's comments? Anything you agree or disagree with? Sam, I think the, the biggest problem we're currently sitting with is out of all the industries in the economy, tourism has probably been the hardest hit. And when we talk about recovery, what we're seeing now is most tourism businesses aren't even at the recovery stage. They're actually still sitting in the, the trying to survive, trying to just stabilize in terms of the impact. We're currently under a lockdown level four, and I'm, I'm literally today, we, we're preparing a submission to the presidency for upcoming Sunday when, when they're reviewing the, the, the command council sitting with regards to proposed lockdown levels after the, the extension of the two weeks. And I think that's quite key for me is that the, the, the recovery stage of businesses has not been reached. They still, and, and they, they're struggling, even the little bit of domestic travel that happened, even with the Gauteng travel ban, has now pushed the occupancy level of a lot of accommodation businesses to below 20-15%. So I think the overall, um, we, we, so, we, we really want to get to the stage of recovery, but we're not there yet as an as a industry and as a country. And I really feel our support mechanisms needed to bolster and and secure is what we said one of the pillars of the recovery plan in terms of secure supply for me just hasn't come through and this is an industry that's at, at risk and whether you're a large medium or small size business you're feeling the impact so for me that's that's a it's a harsh reality which we're experiencing above and beyond all the looting and the other crises on crises that we are facing yeah and to Cesar's point we're not even talking about the brand South Africa that has negative, negatively been in, uh, uh, impacted, impacted by the recent uh, looting, but we will ask that question as we as we go through the session. Um, Opa, let me let me drop into this conversation an immediate reaction to our keynote speaker. Hi, Opa, are you there? Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, the two yes. things that I really, really, I, I, I just picked up and, and, and uh, I know my friend, my good friend, is uh, very eloquent in understanding how government works. But I think one of the things that I, I, have a, I have a challenge with as part of this whole planning thing from government is that the, 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 the key guys that are on the, the the surface you know on the cold face which is largely these business owners uh, they're really really not taken seriously when these plans are put together these plans are put by consultants and government officials that have never in their life some of them run uh, tourism businesses and and as a result you find that there's a disconnect between what we as the private sector think recovery should be and what government uh, thinks a recovery should be. And I think secondly, it would be the issue of safety and security. I mean, we are, we are seeing the, the, the current now with this uh, security cluster, our security cluster. It's a joke what is happening there, you know, where the, the security cluster is, is, is not agreeing on whether it is an insurrection or mm -hmm. it's just a looting spree. And, and these are people that, you are hoping that they will be sending a correct message because whatever they are saying in public is not only consumed by us South Africans, it is consumed by the world. So if we are not even agreeing, 
it basically is then says that South Africa, again, is not a safe country, not only for its citizens, but also for internationals. So we really, really need to get our act together as soon as yesterday, uh, if we are really going to have to recover this industry. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Opa. Uh, Lebo, let's bring you into this conversation very quickly, your immediate reaction to our keynote speaker. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sam. I think he's basically touched on everything. There's a lot of issues. I think um, some of the issues are definitely out there with government. Some of the issues are private sector sort of organizational issues. But I think also um, one of the, the big things we need right now, as you see the diversity in this panel today, we need there's multiple problems and the only way to solve those multiple problems is bring in a broad range of stakeholders on board um, to help find the solution. So I don't think it's a very binary or easy problem to solve around how you rebuild and rebuild a better tourism industry. It definitely needs a lot of collaboration. Um, I liked what he was talking about, um, the number of eggs that are that are correct um, for something like the, the NetBank Golf Challenge. And tourism goes beyond some of what we, even like our opening music that, that we had um, is from a marimba band that, that's in the East Rand called um, Easy Marimba Group. And even someone who, who might be off the, the radar or in that second economy um, where, where we don't need them also benefiting from it. And there's a huge multiplier from it. I think probably looking forward, I'd say, or a good place to start would probably looking at what you can do as an SME if you're out there. Um, yes, you might have a great product, but I think one of the big priorities is probably looking at your channels. Um, going onto your app and trying to see all the big airlines is landing at RTI um, doesn't really help that much right now. Um, and I was in Hermanis um, beginning of the year. They were really complaining that um, they're hoping to see some foreign tourists coming in because the, the, the town is in dire straits right now. Um, they're not getting the bookings. The bulk of the tourism is driven by tourists from outside of South Africa. And I think it also does need a, a big rethink by um, tourism entrepreneurs around where am I going to find the tourists and how do I get closer to those tourists? Thank you, Lebo. I think it's fair to say that there is the general understanding amongst our panelists that this is a perfect opportunity to remold, to rebuild an industry that has left, as Pakimila was saying, youth out of an industry. But to Ilse's point also that there is currently an industry or there are people in this industry that are suffering at the moment. And then to Opa's point that these consultations are happening without the actual people on the ground involved. Um, our theme was rebuilding, but I, I have to ask this question. It sounds like everybody has a different agenda. What do we prioritize first? Do we look at youth coming into the industry or do we just try and save the current businesses that are in the industry? And Ilse, you're currently in government. Oprah's argument is you guys develop policies, but very few of you actually run a tourism business, have actually been involved in a tourism business other than policy and regulation. If I can respond to that, so um, I could just speak from our perspective, but um, we, we cannot make policy decisions in absence of speaking to business. It works hand in hand. And I don't think the, it's the, the policy decision of saying this versus that. Um, I know there's priorities, but one, you need to ensure that they, you need to secure the pipeline. If a visitor comes to South Africa, what are they going to come and see and do? Um, and that's where the recovery plan was talking about securing supply. So our attraction value as a country has to be protected and it, it needs to come. And it's not for me, it's not a payoff in terms of not supporting the youth at the cost of ensuring that our, our, our offering is still stabilized. So I think that's a myth if we say that it's an opportunity cost of the one versus the other. But it's key without private sector business, because if we talk about 
entrepreneurship, if we talk about product development, that sits at the hands of an entrepreneur. It does not sit in government. Government is there to create an environment for businesses to flourish. And we've got such a difficult task currently because businesses need help. They need help with regards to relief aid. They need help with regards to the policy decisions that are being made. You do not know the number of hours I've spent over the last 18 months um, working 16, 17 hours a day, having to write submissions to COCTA, having to write submissions to National about revising lockdown regulations at the cost of saying, why are we, and, and it's, it's a difficult decision because currently we're saying, lift the travel ban in Gauteng. We need Gauteng travelers for domestic travel. It's quite key because actually, um, it's actually the COVID virus of the Delta virus is now spread across the country. It's no longer just contained in Gauteng. And, and I don't think South Africa is taking, um, if I compare it to other countries with regards to policy decisions, we're not faring bad. There's this impression that South Africa, the, you know, it's, we, we, the, the, the decisions are taken to at the cost of the, of the country, but there's a lot of other countries like the UK who have taken much, they've been in like a hard lockdown, a level five lockdown, three or four times. South Africa, we haven't taken that approach. So, and it's a very difficult position because it can change. If you could, if I can take you back to last year, April, May, our lives were changing on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, things were changing. And unfortunately, from a business perspective, to adapt to that is, 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 is quite tough because you have to adapt your strategy, your planning. So uh, I, I completely agree. Taking a business decision for a policy or, or taking a policy decision cannot happen in isolation without business. Absolutely. There, there is no this or that. Um, Ilsa, I want to bring Baka Mule into this conversation, but I just want to throw, come back to you. There's something that Denise mentioned, and it's the question that I actually asked. And I know that um, thought leaders like yourself would like to, when they speak to the public, to us laymen, talk about this intrinsic balance that exists within the office. We know it doesn't exist. At the moment, you've got X amount of money and you're under X amount of strain, you've got to prioritize the funding. So to say that youth should be brought in and it doesn't, we shouldn't do the one at the cost of the other, we know that there are priorities. The niece is, I think we should firstly look at how to keep businesses afloat during this crisis and how to get internationals back. Thereafter, we need to set up skills and learning for youth. The niece argument is we can't do both at the same time. What do you prioritize? Because Pakamili is saying, we, the, and everybody's been saying, everybody agrees we should rebuild, but how do we rebuild when there's only X amount of money and we need to get tourists into those businesses? We need to get, we need to get money into the economy. So right now, at this moment, who should we focus on? There's a, we follow a very simple stat strategy, three letters, CAR, contain, adapt, recover. And that's what I was mentioning early in terms of when you have to prioritize in terms of what we have to do, the containment phase in terms of buckling down and, and, and stabilizing the, the blood loss is, is key. And that drives decision making before the adaptation and the recovery of businesses with regards to recovering and achieving growth. So currently there is a definitely a need in terms of prioritizing in terms of containment and making sure that the losses are stabilized. So that governs with regards to why a lot of the funding has been prioritized towards relief aid. Um, and that's really what's, what's governing our decision-making currently. Wakamele, reaction from you, because um, we are trying to rebuild and, and many people, experts are saying that this is the perfect opportunity to, to not redesign the old model, but to rebuild a new model. But of course there is, there's not unlimited funding. We have no. to, to Ilsa's point, identify what is the most important aspect. But we have seen with the riots that there is, when you are talking about a youth unemployment rate that is sitting at astronomical levels, you're looking at an industry that actually has the potential to absorb a lot of that youth, create business. Where do we start? What do we, what do we prioritize at this moment on the 22nd of July, at 25 minutes past three, past three, what do we, what do we prioritize, Pakamele? 
So Sam, I absolutely agree with, with Elsa. The two are not mutually exclusive in my view. It's not to say that we focus on, on youth and then we don't focus on established business. Um, in my view, and, and again, you know, based on practical reality on the ground for SMMEs, to your point, is it Denise in the question? Yes, Denise. Businesses are not afloat right now. Tourism, small businesses have not been afloat since March 2020. You know, so anybody who is currently in the South African tourism sector and is somehow holding on, they're holding on for dear life and they're looking for any kind of lifeline that is going to help them either be able to rebuild as we're talking about today or somehow be able to remain dormant and, and be able to, to revive the business when the economy opens up fully again. Um, the opportunity with young people is really for me in terms of innovation and in the digital and technology skills that are desperately needed in the tourism sector in order for us to rebuild. Those skills, the young people who are busy sitting on Facebook right now, who understand Instagram, who understand TikTok, who understand all of these digital platforms that small business owners could be leveraging to at least be speaking to the domestic market in a way that they can actually hear them and, and be attracted to their tourism product, those young people are desperately needed by these small business owners, but they have no money to be paying salaries, right? So if we are creative in how we even fund these businesses as we're looking to rebuild, we need to start thinking about, okay, maybe we fund a young person for every small business in the tourism industry or a group of young people who are going to come and do their digital marketing for them. Those are very practical solutions to, to issues facing both young people and new entrants in the tourism industry, as well as established players. The other one, Sam, is just in terms of collaboration, right? Um, I am approached very frequently by established white owned uh, businesses in the tourism sector. And this is even before the Tourism Transformation Fund came about, where people, no, sorry, the Equity Fund is the latest one, where people are saying, listen, I've, I've been running this BNB at the cradle of humankind. It's doing really well, but I'm tired now. I'm looking for a young person to come in and buy me out. I can't just leave it. I need to be bought out, right? And they're very keen to help this person run the business, et cetera, hand over in a sustainable way. But where do I, as a middle-aged, sorry, as a 60 year old white guy, find a BE partner to come and buy into my business? So it's not that the opportunities are not there. The opportunities are there. People are open. People are wanting to collaborate and work together. But the mechanisms of how we go about doing that are not necessarily there. Okay, really, I've got to talk to you about the mechanisms, mechanisms, and I've got to ask you that question. I mean, both yourself, Cesa, Ilsa, Lebu, Opa, and a bunch of the other people um, watching this uh, conversation at the moment have years and years of experience. Why has it taken you guys so long to put the proper mechanisms in place? Because it sounds like you've got the answers. I mean, COVID hit. I mean, that was unforeseen, but. If, if the, so if some of the answers are so simple, why are they not in place yet? So Sam, I'm going to speak again from the perspective of, of probably the youngest person on the panel and you know one of the most active young people in the tourism industry. For me, the realization that I've had since we started Zulu Nomad in 2016 is the fact that nobody's coming to save us, right? Nobody is coming to invent these. The government is doing the policy things. The established associations are doing, you know, the best that they can for, for their market and suppliers. There's nobody who is coming to save any young person or small business owner who really is struggling at the moment or even before COVID, right? It's, it's about us collaborating as young people, us collaborating as small business owners to come up with the solutions ourselves. The approach that we take at Zulu Nomad is to create the solutions as far as we can and with the very, very little that we can, right? We go out there and we partner with other businesses. We partner with, with um, other young people um, in South Africa and outside of South Africa to drive some of these solutions that we're looking for. Um, 
just before COVID, one of the initiatives that we were trying to introduce into the South African market is a hackathon for specifically South African tourism tech development. And we got zero support at any level for that um, because there was just this lack of understanding of what is tourism tech, where does this fit in? But we can't now sit back and go, oh no, we're not gonna do anything about it. Instead, we realize people need to see what it is that we're talking about so that they're able to engage with it. Thankfully, well, not thankfully, but one of the byproducts of COVID-19 has been this openness now to digital solutions and tech-enabled solutions. So the conversation is a little bit easier to have now, um, but you can't stop, you know, as, as an SMME, as a small business owner, entrepreneur, the innovators in, in every industry in South Africa know you've just got to pick up and, and do it yourself. For sure. Um, thanks, Bagamile. Um, Opa, I want to bring in this conversation because you've heard Ilsa and you've heard Bagamile. And when we had our um, session yesterday, um, before we started this official uh, program today, we were meant to go back to what was life like before COVID and what was it like now? And the, the reality is I think everybody has a sense of it. And I don't think there's no, there's an actual reason to go down that path. I think jumping into the hands-on issues of what's going on in the country at the moment, how are people feeling for me on the back of um, Namonde's opening address and CISA's opening address makes a lot more sense. So I wanna, I wanna come back to your response now. I mean, Ilsa says, of course, we can't develop these policies without speaking to business owners. And she sits in the Western Cape and you sit in a, a different part of the country, but you also have a deep understanding of processes within government. For somebody who's a business owner and understands the process of government to then say, in actual fact, government doesn't speak to us. If you read a message here, and I'm just going to drop some of them in, um, Nomzamo says, I agree with Pakamile. Our business had an opportunity to buy over an establishment. The owners were ready to sell, and we did all the paperwork and we applied for the equity fund, but it was stopped. No hope at all. Yet Ilsa tells us that, and, and it might be the case in the Western Cape. I mean, I come from the Western Cape. Um, it might be that they have a more proactive uh, approach to engaging with, with owners, but you're an owner of a, of, a, of a business, and you're saying that we're not being engaged. There are many people talking about how institutions have let, let them down. And, and before I ask my follow-up question, I just want, what's the, what's the reality here? What is it actually on the ground? If you are an owner of a business at the moment that is holding on for dear life, waiting for some funding intervention, waiting for some government policy, waiting for lockdown to be lifted, because Unless I've walked a mile in your shoes, I've got no understanding. Sorry, Opa, can you put on your, your mic? Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to get used to this. Paga, uh, you, you need to come in here. Um, I think the reality is now, and, and, and I just want to... just want to like, you know, outline them so that we understand is that now is about land that needs to pay rates and taxes. And I don't have the money to pay the rates and taxes. And we are saying to government, government, here is a situation that you see, it is not in our own making. Is it possible that you can convert our rates and taxes into residential rates instead of making us pay commercial rates, which are almost three or four times higher than the normal rates. So local government says no. So we go into the provincial level. We are saying we are, we've got restaurants that we are running and these restaurants, we have to renew uh, licenses, operating licenses, liquor licenses every year and we are operating safari vehicles. We've got to renew licenses to operate in the Kruger National Park. And both of them say no, you know? And, and, and this is, these are the realities that we are sitting with currently now. 
where they are saying that if you don't pay this amount of money and therefore you are we are going to switch off your electricity we are going to cut off your water you are not going to operate uh, your vehicle uh, as a safari vehicle in the kruger national park for, for 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 an example so these are realities that we are we are having and then then what happens is that at national level, SARS is going to say to us, no, 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 no. Uh, we understand what is going on, but you've got to pay your, your vet, you've got to pay your tax as if normal, uh, uh, we are under a normal uh, situation. So again, these are some of the challenges that as we are sitting right now, we are feeling the pinch. And most of our tour operators, most of our product owners, they have to pay the banks and the banks are not taking uh, no for an answer. So, and when we do these lockdowns, I mean, the current lockdowns as the president has announced, he did not, did not provide any relief. It was lockdown and this is what we are going to do. And it is going to be two weeks and two weeks, it is going to be another two weeks. And no one is saying, oh, guys, you, we are locking you down and As a sector, we understand you've got challenges. So these are the relief that we are, uh, uh, and they are looking for their money as if, and that's how we feel right now. We are on our own and we've got to see how we get out of this mess on our own. For sure. And I mean, I just want to put a declarative statement that I'm not, I'm not directing all of it at Ilsa just because she happens to be at the, in that position, but I think it is fair to get a balanced perspective of currently what's happening. And to your point, somebody, um, Namdamo just said, Sam, I was an intern uh, at the tourism in the Western Cape. I worked as a giant art planning and development officer, and I can testify to you that the government has a challenge of engaging the businesses on the ground. Money was even returned back because they did not do anything. No assessment to see where the money is needed. So that's just a reaction from, from Namzamo. Let, let me just get your thoughts on Pakamila before I go to Lebo. Pakamila says, and Ilsa says, and they concur that the one doesn't have to be at the expense of the others. I am, I am a journalist and I like to throw the cat amongst the pigeons sometimes. And, and, I've, and I've got to ask you the question, is it as simple as Pakamila makes it to be that there are young people with great ideas. There are business owners, SMME owners that need gaps in the market. It's really a simple question of them just finding each other. Now, Pakamile is obviously um, the incredibly eloquent, um, very well distinguished. Um, she didn't really answer my question around who's to blame because if everybody has the same idea, why are these systems not put in place yet? Why can't that young person find that business owner? Why can't they meet each other halfway? Why can't they use technology? Are they young people, Opa? And I'm asking you as a, as a, as a business owner in this space, is it as simple as what Pakamile claims that there are young people who are ready to step in? There are business owners looking for opportunities, but they're missing each other. Or is there more to this? Look, it is, it, is, it is extremely simple, you know, uh, 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 from, from a practitioner point of view. It is simple. And, 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 and I think for us is that we've got to be, and that's why I'm saying that it is very, very key that when we develop certain policy matters, I sometimes feel like as business, we've got to be in the center of driving this economic recovery, you know, because, and, and, and government, uh, looking at balancing uh, out instead of the other way around where government is taking the role of wanting to drive this economic recovery and we are just coming in to fill in the gaps you know so it is becoming uh, important that we 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 basically have to understand our role in this entire uh, 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 sequence of things and and that role it, it doesn't need because from 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 my experience from the public sector side is that there's competition of, of space be with the private sector when there is no need for us to compete because we play our roles differently. So let's come back to, 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 to young people. Um, young people need assistance and government can make these facilities and, and resources available 
uh, to young people. And the problem is that it becomes very, very difficult. I'm saying, why does it take me 48 hours to go to a commercial bank, apply for a loan, and be told that I can get it and I can't get it? Why does it take government six months to get that answer? You know, so there is serious challenges on the, on the, on the public sector side because from a, from a private sector perspective, from a commercial bank perspective, I can be told within 48 hours that you can either get this money or you can't get this money, but it takes longer from government to be able to do that. So that causes this uh, uh, bottlenecks uh, in terms of us moving forward. All we need to do uh, in government is that we need to operate with as much speed as we possibly can. And, and, and I think there's some sort of a laser sphere, you know, at, 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 to understand the current conditions that we are operating in because speed now is of paramount importance for me. But yes, we can make a change, we can make a dent. And I think South Africa has got the resources to really, really make a dent in this youth unemployment. Lebo, uh, Pakamile is, is shaking a head in agreement. Is speed, um, to Opa's point, is that really one of the issues um, that if there was the same kind of attention the way private entities run their business, the private banks, that if government applied that model, that we would, we would see a dramatic dip and change in those numbers and maybe see more of that collaboration? Um, definitely speed speed is one of um, the things governments would probably need to get right government and industry associations but also it's it's direction it's knowing where we're running to because in a lot of cases I think you do get the speed from government um, but it's not on critical things so I think in addition to that speed government and um, the broader stakeholders um, need to take a step back and really think about what are the critical success factors for the different types of businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector. Because I think that the one major thing about the sector, it's extremely complex. It's got multiple stakeholders. Um, so right now I'm at, I'm at the gorge. Um, there's the main business here, but there's also uh, Umama that I was talking to now with her kids here, who's selling um, all sorts of arts and crafts. So her interest, yes, would be aligned to the place that I'm at right now, but there'd also be very specific interests that she has and very specific needs that she has and she would want to, government to assist with those sort of um, issues that she has. So it's different, multiple types of stakeholders, different needs, but I think what we definitely do need is speed, but also a very focused um, attempt at understanding what is it in particular that would help us in terms of low-hanging fruit, um, the major key success factors to make tourism work? And I think we've got a lot of models. So um, I'll speak from an AMI perspective. We, we've been a part of different initiatives, for example. Uh, we know the history of the country. And, and the focus, again, is very forward-looking. If you bring the youth into the tourism sector, you're allowing that transformation um, from the different generations that, that Paramil has, has, has spoken um, to. Um, I think we're, we're experiencing technical issues with level. I did see a notice earlier that there was going to be load shedding. I don't know if he's been affected by that. Um, maybe throwing that that a quick quick response from you, Pakamile. Um, I do want to, in the last twenty minutes, look at solutions and some of the stuff that um, um, Cesa mentioned, like um, dynamic um, uh, pricing, looking at um, different interventions, looking at strategies to bring locals back into into the industry. But yet again, Denise also references something else, that the funding mechanism is, is skewed against young people. That there are young people that have the energy to, to buy a small lodge or guest house and then partner with the experience of the Oprahs in the world. Just from your sense and your understanding, I mean, you run two very successful businesses. Is that a fair assessment to say that the funding mechanism and how we look at entrepreneurship within the tourism industry 
is still is is still very outdated. Absolutely, Sam. So that is one of the biggest challenges, right? So you have a growing number of young people in South Africa. I mustn't call. I think when we when we refer to small business owners as young people, we sort of take away a little bit from their yeah. business owner status, but they're business owners, right? So you've got a lot of uh, emerging business owners who've come up so really 2016, 2017 onwards, who are creating unique tourism product in the South African market, product that did not exist before, product that is targeted at the Black African market that now has a disposable income that we didn't have before. Now, you get these young people applying for funding, the tra tourism transformation fund, the green incentive, the tourism sector is not short of funds that people can apply for, but they're very much out of reach. You know, young people are not looking for um, 40 million rand to build the Hraskop Gorge as Butopa has been able to do in South Africa today. A young person is looking for 500,000 rand, a million rand to buy a vehicle maybe, a couple of hundred thousand rand to get a small team to keep the business going, to have some cash flow. These funds are out of reach. I'm not looking for 50 million. I'm not looking for a hundred million. Give me 30,000 maybe to give me something that I desperately need in my business today that's going to make a difference in my business today. Ilse, do you have programs like that in the Western Cape where somebody can get access to that limited, to the small amounts and get kick-started immediately into business? Yes, we've got something called the SMME Booster Fund, which is anywhere from 50 up until, I think they've got a few hundred thousand rand gap that it fills the, that, mar, that, that need specifically. So we've partnered with other organizations like CEDA and CIFA, um, et cetera. We've, we've just run ours. I think we put this year, the funding that was made available was about 27 million rand. Um, specifically for Western Cape SMEs. And the challenges that uh, Pakamile was talking about is actually not just limited to tourism industry, it's actually SMEs in general, um, because access to funding is one thing, because the majority of the times where we see people falling out is basic things, submit a cash flow, you have a registered business. So it's, to be honest with you, we need to also spend time working in capacitating startups with regards to business practices to put them on the road to being successful business owners. Oftentimes there's this, there's this um, obsession about funding, but they fall out of the, they can't price properly. They don't, they don't have a business plan. They've got no social, we're talking about digital. These basic skills, business skills. I ran an economic development department at a local authority for six years for, for, for economic development. And that's what I've spent so much time training businesses to have the basic business skills in place um, before they can even apply for funding. So I think the, the, the overall setting up um, the, the, the path for more entrepreneurs, because that's, that's key for me. When we talk transformation is making sure there's more participa participants e entering more product, not just taking from, from what's there, but growing the pie instead of just sort of the pie is not growing. So that for me is, is absolutely necessary to have a future for tourism in South Africa. Um, Lebo, Ilsa mentioned something that I think is a, is a critical component. And uh, Pakamile, I respect what you're saying. We will no longer refer them uh, to as young people, but as business owners irrespective of their age, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> let me the understanding of, and part of the reason, here's a business owner, has a viable, credible idea, but struggles just to understand how to do quotes and pricing and put those plans together. Um, could that really be, I mean, we finger point and say, government is not doing this, organizations are not doing this. But if you lack the basic understanding of how to fill out a, or create a business plan, which is needed until there's a new model of doing it, um, could, that, could it be as simple as just these business owners don't know how to put their, their, their documents together? Um, yes, definitely. So sorry about that. I'm, I'm joining you from basically the edge of the gorge and the wind is quite strong. I think it's blowing away some of the bandwidth. So <laughs> apologies for dropping off earlier. Um, I, I think I, I agree with you. So what we've seen and I, and I was talking about Rwanda before I dropped off, I believe that complex problems like the problems we have in South Africa 
um, and many other developing countries need integrated solutions. So we can't just uh, imagine a cube. There's so many issues that we have. And if, if you were to ask 10 or five or um, 20 different uh, practitioners in the sector, there would be some divergence on some areas of what they feel is important. So one thing we've seen in the past 18 months or so of the lockdown is that in cases where you provide financial support, where you provide grants or money or funding to enterprises like Ilse has spoken to, where they, they, they're not very strong on financial management, they haven't sat down and really thought about where the priority areas in my business to keep the business running, um, maybe to even shift what I'm doing now to deal with, with the kind of tourists I have now. And, and looking to what Cisa spoke to earlier, for example, maybe your local tourists don't drink as much coffee. Maybe you need to look at um, maybe selling your coffee machine. Um, that sort of thinking and shifting with the times, um, you, you do definitely need some non-financial support, which could include business training. Um, it could include um, a lot of other capacity building around the business itself, maybe training your supervisors, maybe improving your service levels. Um, and even relooking your product, all of those things in conjunction with the financial aid, I think is what I've seen really working well. And again, looking at other markets where we feel it's really going well. Um, if, if your business doesn't exist nowadays on digital media, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, on sort of digital platforms, on YouTube, if it doesn't exist there, it almost doesn't exist in the world right now. And Again, we look at Rwanda. Rwanda has massive adoption of, 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 of the internet. There's massive access to the internet. And what that does, it means that somebody who's looking to come to Africa will be bombarded with quite a lot of media, a lot of content from Rwanda. Again, because everybody has access to the internet. So I think the really important thing is looking at integrated solutions, combining the financial solutions, maybe grants, maybe tax relief, uh, maybe relief in terms of rates, but combining that with non-financial um, solutions, things like how do we improve market access for, for entrepreneurs? And again, um, you can look at like what, what, what Paga is doing, Paga Mila is doing, looking at how do you allow, how do you get um, someone, um, whether they're here in Crosscope where I am, or someone in Hermanus, how do you get that person in Berlin, um, in San Francisco, um, in Madrid, for example, and start interacting with a potential client, a potential traveler. So I think that's the kind of thinking we need to start having. Follow up question quickly. Um, Ilsa talks about the booster fund and she talks about that there's about 27 million rand sitting there. And I'm sure that when we speak to OPA, OPA is also aware of different funds. Is it as simple as that the interventions have been built, but there's been no, there's no loudspeaker to say to young people, by the way, years of fund, years of fund, years an incubation program, years a business planning tool, like we heard from the Monday this morning that Facebook offers free um, uh, um, courses. So is it, is it that there isn't a centralized platform where people can go and just see opportunities? Because if you would speak to everybody, you hear that there are opportunities. I mean, Pakamile talks about um, business owners and young people approaching her. Is it just as simple as that? It's all siloed and nobody has taken the time to say, here is a final destination to engage with every opportunity that exists within South Africa. Whether it is DA running the Western Cape or ANC running the Gauteng, is it, do we need a central place level? So definitely, I think we, we need that leadership from the national level. Um, there's, there's a huge role for provincial and even municipal level sort of planning around tourism and even regional. Because again, looking at, at um, for example, the Western Cape, how you market the, um, the winelands and, and the different region within the winelands is, is, is very different to how you'd market, for example, um, township tours. And... Definitely there's, there's, there's need for integration within government in the thinking, but I think looking at something like the tourism recovery plan, the research, the data behind it is really great as a starting point. Um, I think the next level is probably then taking it to, to the different provinces and truly understanding or getting much closer 
to the different practitioners in, in that space. And again, you look at the tourism recovery plan um, from, from the national sort of government level, and it tells you that accommodation establishments, almost 80% of the different types of accommodation establishments, between 60 and 80% are actually making less than 5 million Rand in revenue per year. So these are micro and small businesses. Some of them are survivalist businesses. And in that same space, you've got uh, multi-million rand hotels. Uh, I've got a huge one that's open in Pretoria. They're all in the same sort of accommodation space, providing a very different product. And I think the larger corporates tend to get a lot more um, attention. Um, they, they are much bigger as well. They are able to access government and have those sort of conversations. But I think what's really critical here is at that um, municipal, at the regional level, at the provincial level, um, to move the strategy much closer to what the changing needs are. And, and the reason why I'm emphasizing changing needs, the needs we had at the beginning of 2020 last year in January, um, in, in February, even in March, we've moved way beyond that. It's, it, we have a very different country. Um, we're competing now in a digital sort of space, in a digital world with the rest of Africa. If somebody Googles Africa, we, we shouldn't really kid ourselves and think that South Africa always pops up at the top. Um, there's so many other things people could do in Africa. Um, we've got the, the, the September sort of break throughout Europe now starting in, in August. Um, we need to start thinking very differently, but the coordination needs to really increase between what we're seeing at a national level and understanding the different needs of all these different practitioners in the space. Opa, I want a reaction from you, um, but... I don't want to drag this conversation back because I think it goes without saying that the riots have yes. not been trying to brand South Africa. CISA talked about it already. Um, and we are in the latter part of our conversation. Um, so I do want to be more solution focused. Um, so your first thing, I mean, uh, unless there's anybody who would like to make, say anything about the riots that we don't already know in terms of its impact on tourism and, 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 and the brand, uh, brand uh, value of, of a country like South Africa, but first of all, your reaction to what, what Lebo is saying, um, and number one. And then number two, I, I want to throw that question at you as well in terms of there are access to resources. Um, let me read you a quick response from Numzama who says, as a youth tourism forum, we have proposed for a business development and funding readiness incubation to curb these kind of challenges. They are still waiting for a response. Somebody talked about speed a little bit earlier. So first of all, your reaction to level, but at the same time, there are opportunities, they do exist, but young people don't know where to go. And if, if Pakamili ran it, I'm 100% sure all young people would be plugged into it tomorrow, but they exist, but where, where, where is it? Look, I think, I think, I think also as, as, as industry associations, we've got a responsibility to pull all these resources together. And, and, and we've got the capacity and the resources to be able to look for these things and create our own suppository of information there to assist government in this whole thing. But secondly, let me just throw a, 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 a spanner. Is that, are we not with all these resources? Are we really not, are we ignoring, let me just say that, are we not are we ignoring the current conditions of the country that a lot of our people economically are sitting in the informal sector? Are our interventions and, and, and only focusing on trying to formalize people and yet there is a working a, a economy of informal people that are, have, have made them survive all these years? Uh, shouldn't we be looking at a mixed breed to say, how do you begin to start people from what they know, the informal sector, and uh, uh, um, uh, migrate them uh, to the formal sector at a later stage? Because most of our interventions are really looking at a more a, a, a formalized way of intervention, which therefore will automatically, automatically leave out the majority of our people and especially young people in, the, in these areas. And if you look also in some of the challenges that we have is that we tend to, to, to use first world, you know, South Africa is almost 70% formal and, 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 and I mean 30% formal 
and 70% rural, where we still are grappling with issues of access to internet. You know, maybe the inter intervention should be that, why as local municipalities, why as provincial government, uh, 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 why as national government, we are not looking at making sure that there is a wall-to-wall -wall access to, 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 to connectivity in this country, because these young people will then have a chance. Some of them don't really, really, really need handouts, but if we are able to provide them with these solutions, they are able to do things themselves. You know, why don't we provide them with access to connectivity if we are digitifying a, 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 and we are talking about a, a, the recovery in terms of digitalization? So let's look at those solutions to say, how do we as policy, as uh, uh, makers, as, 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 as business uh, 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 owners also come into the party by ensuring that we don't ignore the, the second economy, which is the informal economy, but we also take that into consideration for our interventions, because that is where the majority of these young people are. And we tend to miss them there because our focus is on the, 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 the first economy, which is the for, formal economy. Uh, I'm going to head towards my, thanks, Opa. I'm going to head towards my last round, but I, Camilla, I want to get a reaction from you to what Opa was saying. I was seeing you, I saw you nod vigorously to, to some of his points. Yes, absolutely. I was in a meeting a few weeks ago and, and, a, and a very old, uh, very experienced gentleman in the tourism industry said something along the lines of, yeah, you know, we talk about township tourism and there was a question about township tourism on the chat here earlier as well yeah. and rural tourism. However, that's not what international people want to come and experience when they come to South Africa. And, and that factually is false, right? Um, if we are to speak about the opportunities for tourism development and for new tourism product in South Africa, we need to understand who is going to be providing the service to begin with. And to put up this point right now, it's largely young people in their informal economy. And these young people in the informal economy are still people with stories and all of these amazing experiences and a history that they could potentially be sharing with the rest of the world. Expedia did a study in 2018, which found that of the UK, UK millennial travelers, 67% of them, when they travel, an authentic experience is the most important part of that travel experience. It's not about the flight, it's not about where they stayed, it's about having that authentic experience. And that culture of authentic experiences and wanting to be immersed in a destination is the same across millennials across the world, right? And young people in townships, young people in rural areas have that product intrinsically. They just don't know how to now package it into something that they can sell to a tourist. And so it's about enabling and empowering young people, whether they're um, in the rural areas or in the township areas or here in Hilbra, with the skills of how to tell these stories. How do you make yourself attractive? to another person from elsewhere in the world, from somewhere else within South Africa, because that's the other thing. We live in the most, one of the most diverse countries in the world, but we don't know the first thing about each other, except that Sam is colored and Pavendran is Indian. And, you know, but we, we don't celebrate, we don't explore our cultures. We, we've got so much, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. South Africa is very rich in tourism product and it's just sitting there so much potential gone to waste um, because people do not know how to translate all of these assets because these are heritage assets that we're speaking about we don't know how to transform at all of these tourism these heritage assets into a tourism product that I'm going to be able to market and make a living out of okay well Camille there's a lot that you've said there and we are running out of time and there's just my mind is pinging all over the place in terms of why don't we know and all those kind of things but i want to start this final round very very quickly with and, and to since this point he's happy that we're not talking about recovery but rebuilding practical and i saw that ilsa just sent out um, a notification with some resources that's available for free that anybody who's still who's watching can click on that link and find out how they can go uh, about getting support. So that's already a resource. 
we will be emailing to everybody who's part of the session additional resources. There's still a competition that we're running as well. But final round, as we wrap up this conversation, this conversation won't be solved in an hour. It's not possible. There's just too many elements to it. It is complex, it's layered. We will have to deal, but you all have, you know, I, I'm, I almost dare do the, the Liam Neeson voice. You all have a set of skills, you know? Um, talk to me, Ilsa, and we're going to you first. If you are an established business at the moment, right? Um, Namonde talked about the digital intervention. There's so many programs. CISO gave us some ideas. But if you are a business at the moment and talking about the township question, um, let me just throw that in just for you to frame around. Um, Nomzamo said, um, how do we digify our businesses? We, we cook traditional cuisines and host long table and food experience. Um, she also said that um, as a small business owner that was just starting, we crashed, we were crushed by the pandemic. Our business is based in the township and it is uh, still difficult to bring tourists to the township. It's probably gonna be harder now with the incidents that happened in KZN and in parts of, of, of Gauteng. What are some of the practical things that they can do right now, Ilsa, that's going to have their businesses be around much longer? What can they do for their businesses this moment? Sam, I think what's critical is, like any other businesses, um, you have to adapt. Do not, I think the, the, the key thing of waiting for somebody to come on a white horse and save you is not there. South Africa has got a fiscal crunch. We are, have limited resources. It's the fights we have to, like what Oprah was, and it really, it, 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 my heart just does this when I hear the the, the, the strain that businesses are under in terms of rate rebates. And that's not, that's just formal businesses saying, I am in trouble and I need help. And now you're trying to negotiate and lobby for, for relief for businesses because that's needed. But businesses need to adapt. Your income streams, you cannot be offering, and Lebo also said it, your business today cannot be offering the same product that you did 24 months ago. The world has changed. So, um, Tour guides, you know, we, we the tour, we've got 5,000 registered tour guides in, in the Western Cape. They have to think of virtual tours. How many of them have got no digital foot, footprint? They sold suppliers. They've got no training. Now, suddenly, you have to be able to offer a tour and you can earn money. And there's a lot of them have adapted and are able to still get an income stream by adapting their businesses. So the first thing is find your free resources. Learn. Look at your business strategy, adapt in terms of your offering with regards to your clientele. You cannot just be reliant on relief aid. You will not survive. You have to be earning income. And that's, that's the challenging things. In South Africa, currently in the Western Cape, we, a lot of our experiences were, were geared towards international travel. That's, that's flipped completely because they're not coming. And we were like, okay, hell, recovery is going to happen in this month and then this month and then this month. Now it's so reliant on domestic travel and you have to understand a new travel. You have to offer a different product. You have to adapt. And that for me is key as a business person. Please don't wait for, for somebody to write your strategy. There is so many webinars. There's so many resources that's free. Join your associations. I always tell my husband, you cannot practice democracy off your couch. You need to stand up and take your hands with democracy. And it's the same with the business owner. You're the owner, the check you right at the bottom of the line. So you've got to be part of the solution. Um, so, and the resources, there's so much out there and it starts with google.com. Oh, so that for me is quite key with regards to what are we offering? And, and for me, the biggest message, if I can leave it today is adapt, adapt, learn, and, and, and become part of that future business that you want to be on offer. Thanks, Sam. One follow-up question quickly. Um, CISA talks about monetizing virtual tours, protecting the, in many ways, almost the IP of the business and not, and not overexposing it through, through these, the visual component, because the reality is that the actual experience is still stepping into that space. How, how do we find that balance? Because we're, we're now having a conversation about rebuilding your business um, in this digital era. 
And loads of businesses, to your point, don't have a digital footprint. And, 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 and it's not a gotcha question. I just want to find out if you don't have that experience at the moment of, be, of creating a digital business, of being a tour, a tour guide who's even thought of, 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 of taking things online or developing streams online, where do you begin? What do you need to just factor in? And I thought that would be a question that I would ask you on the back of what you were saying. So there's different, it depends on where your business is. If you can afford, if you've got the, the funding, you can always get a social media expert in to assist you. If you cannot, in terms of free resources, um, you can access it through CEDA. CEDA actually gives SMMEs vouchers to access um, digital support. You can, we offering in the Western Cape, we're doing winter schools now in, in at the end of the month where we're encouraging businesses. We're getting experts from Instagram and social media to give people free access to training of doing basic things. South African tourism is, they've signed up, there's a partnership with Google where they Google my business. Um, free resources once again that you can access. So I think that the basics in place is if you do not know, ask for support, go to your local CEDA office and join, for example, I, I can just talk about the, our experiences, your local tourism office. They often help businesses just to do the basics or provide them with a placeholder. So there's different levels of support that's available for free for businesses. And again, as I said, start with Googling. What do I need to have in place for a digital footprint? Just educate yourself. Go and watch a few YouTube videos. It's there. So, sorry, Sam, um, just, just to add to what Elsa yes, said, I think um, from our experience last year, so we had thousands of entrepreneurs across the, the continent um, sign up for our boot camps around business survivability last year. And from like a business management thinking perspective, the most critical thing is staying close to your client, to your customer. And what I'd say in some cases, digital isn't even the solution, but understand who your customer is, what are their changing needs? And then also, where am I going to find them? Because you could still be trying to sell a, a pre-COVID, pre-lockdown product and the business has moved, the sector has moved. Um, the sort of needs that the, this particular client of yours has, has also evolved. So it's, for me, the, even the existence of your business, the even the reason of existence for your business is the client. So always start with the client and then you can build everything else out, including your channels. To put with that, so you talked about some of those courses. What are some of the other practical interventions that you, and I mean, I love um, Ilsa, all her points. I think if you're sitting with a pen and a, and a, and a piece of paper, this is really the, the kind of moment where the, the, those kind of light bulbs go off and say, oh, I haven't thought of that. Um, we, talked about, we talked about dynamic pricing. We talked about those aspects and CISA unpacked all of that a little bit earlier. But just from your perspective and your experience, what are some of the real tangible interventions that if you're a business owner on this platform at the moment, you are stuck, you've got your back against the wall, you, there's limited opportunities. And, and like I've said, Ilsa's already um, illustrated some amazing ones. Just what else can you factor in? Free courses, paid for courses, going to, what would you, what would you suggest? So I think um, from an AMI perspective, we will be offering um, support for SM, SMEs in the tourism sector from next week. A uh, very short sort of program that we offer that will really help them deal with uncertainty, deal with um, a constantly changing situation. So we'll look at scenario planning and understanding. What if the tourists don't come? What do I do then? What is my cash runway? Um, understanding also things like risk management because yes, we're talking and hoping that the tourists are going to come um, um, through our tambo and all of the international airports in August, but what if they don't come? Then what do I do with my business? And, and saying to SMEs in the sector, have a plan in case the worst happens. Don't find yourself uh, in a situation where the worst does happen and you haven't even thought about it. Um, we'll be providing those sort of tools. Last year, we reached, um, I think, close to 15,000 SMEs across the African continent on our network called the Thrive Network. We'll provide a broad range of tools, um, also for free, um, looking broadly at capacity building, um, speaking to 
sort of thought leaders across the continent, different types of businesses who speak to things like market access, um, things like bootstrapping, um, how to prioritize and what, how, how do I develop my product and get the product better? Um, those are the kind of resources we provide. We also look at um, the entrepreneur as a person. So we've got a program called Rise. We sometimes speak to business and forget that um, you've got a team behind you and you as an entrepreneur um, are probably very, very stressed if you are in that situation where you're looking for that sort of help. Um, look for other resources as well. Um, and, and, and for us, RISE looks at the entrepreneur, it looks at how to manage your stress, how to get yourself energized in the right frame of mind um, to do what you need to do to make the business a success. Um, we're also hoping quite soon to respond to the current unrest that you're experiencing in the country. Um, we'll be looking at scholarships. So I think if people do follow our page, they'll be able to see scholarships for one of our longer programs. Um, we'll definitely share that and update on that um, in the coming days. Okay, Level, thank you very much. Um, I, I was looking for, for, I wanted to give the last word to Oprah in this segment, but I'm gonna go to Oprah first and then go to Pakamili. Oprah, you've got the practical experience. You are one of those, you, you do straddle both your business owner and entrepreneur. What are some of the things that you've had to look at as, an, as a short-term solutions to deal with the, the industry that you're finding yourself? It is hemorrhaging. Um, Lebel was saying, what if the borders don't open? If, if we're going to have to keep on driving South Africans into these spaces, um, surely the strategy has to change. I think more than one panelist has said, we ca you can't be using an outdated strategy model because your business has already changed. So what are you currently doing that you can share with the audience that, I mean, it's a difficult word to use, future-proofs your business, but that currently keeps your business afloat? I think for us, the, key, the, the first thing that we did was to understand that the, our business does not operate in isolation. So we had to basically locate our business within a broader destination. And for an example, we are based in Mpumalanga in the Panorama Route. And one of the things that we did was when we marketed our, our, our business, we were not marketing one business, but we were marketing the route because we realized that a whole lot of domestic travelers were experiential travelers and they needed to do activities. So we had to put together some sort of an educational program around what could be found in the panorama route and what are the other things that could be done. And we've seen that happening, but also we had to look at adapting some of our activities. I mean, initially we were planning to do a, a, a mountain bikes and, a, and, and we realized that that's, that does, it's not gonna work. And we converted that and we had to reposition our products to zip lines uh, so that these are the types of activities that we realize that our domestic market likes uh, to do. So for accommodation, we advised accommodation guys to say that what we have seen was that uh, uh, self-catering was becoming more and more popular. So if you've got a guest house and, and, and or whether a small hotel or motel is that just adapt it such that you are able to allow people to do their own self-catering, uh, looking into the current economic uh, uh, strains that we are, are facing. So I think one of the key things that I would stress uh, now uh, to most of the entrepreneurs is that you are not going to survive this alone. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Packages are key. Put together various uh, packages with all this other establishment around your, 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 your area. Join associations. You are not going to survive this on your own. But most importantly, let's, we have also a responsibility is that uh, we've got to, in these trying times, as business people, come into the space to mentor and teach these aspiring. And I'm calling on everyone on this platform now, if you are on this platform and you are, you, 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 you are either running a business or that make time, make time. It is in the interest of our safety and security. It is the interest of our country as patriots that we make time to mentor these young people. 
that's basically what the, the, the things that we need to do as, 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 as a country and as businesses. That's fantastic, Opa. Thank you very much. And hopefully at some point, somebody in government, um, wink, wink, will, <laughs> will um, ask the questions. And I think it's very important to your point that now we need those roundtables and those discussions because they are practical lived experiences. Um, Pakamile, are you with us? Um, we, are, we are wrapping up this, this conversation. And I mean, Ilse said some amazing stuff and she's now shared more tips like find your digital community, continue to learn and adapt your strategy, use all free business resources. Um, Lebo, there was a question around the winter schools and I'm sure you will, you will respond to, to Bertus Haywood about the, the winter schools. Um, um, Opa was talking about just finding innovative ways to adapt to the current situation because if we, if we don't collaborate, if we don't collaborate, and if we don't look at it as a, instead of an individual player, but how do we collaborate across the board to create a, a, an entire experience? Just from your, from, your, from your understanding, what are some of the practical things that business who are watching right now, what can they do? I mean, there's been a ton of insight, but just what do you need to do? You also talked about if you're not digital savvy, there is a young person in your community that is. So what would you encourage them to do right now? So everything that Ilsa and Levo and Budopa have said is literally what I had on, <laughs> down on my list in terms of what practically people can do, because that is honestly it, you know, collaboration, 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 ask questions, don't sit there and die of anxiety of, on your own in your house. Yes, go through that, but you need to then rise above it and actually find people who can help you. There are people who can can help you and it doesn't have to be monetary because there's very few people can help you with money however there are people in your community there are people within tourism associations who can be of help to you in some of the challenges that you're facing in your business um, I'm just going to mention a few things that haven't um, been mentioned already so when you introduced me, Sam, you mentioned that I'm the co-chair of SATSA's Access, Inclusivity and Diversity Committee. And we have actually set up a Facebook page. It's a private group though. So if everyone can just find me on Facebook, add and then say, reference this webinar, please. And I'll add you onto that group. But the purpose of that group is exactly what the quick to answer the question you're asking, Sam, to say, where do I go? Like, where is there a central place where all of these things are? So we're not quite there yet because we don't have all of the solutions and all of this needs these funding at the end of the day right however we knew that the first place to start in the very least is to have the space a digital space where people of like mind in the tourism sector tourism and hospitality can come together and and start having these conversations and start finding people to potentially partner with and work with on different projects because it is a challenge at the moment right um i think that's a very practical one that hasn't been mentioned but again, you need to reinvent yourself. So Ilza, to add on some of the resources that Ilza mentioned, you know, you've got these online universities that also offer free courses. Um, there's Course Era, there's, you know, uh, Udemy, there's various um, kinds of, of online courses that you can take to support yourself as or as you're going through your business. Because Sometimes it's not about completing an MBA at, at the most expensive schools, but it's just finding the questions to the, the answers to the questions that you have in the immediate term in your business. And a lot of that people are sharing online. A lot of that is freely available online. I know that then the question becomes data and access, but I think what Opa spoke, spoke to that earlier in terms of our priorities as well as a nation, we definitely need to be prioritizing access to connectivity for people in townships, rural areas and urban areas in South Africa. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's definitely find your tribe. Again, you may be the oddest, weirdest person or running the strangest, most unique uh, tourism experience or product in the world. There are people out there to, to whom you would be very attractive. That product would be very attractive. A lot of the time, those people are online already. Millennials globally, when looking for things to do and traveling, 
they look for you five places online, let alone you just getting your website to begin with. They look for you five places in the minimum online. Make sure that you're visible, make yourself attractive to your tribe and they will find you online. So that would be me, Sam. I know that I'm definitely repeating some of the points that have been made before, but I think it speaks to the, re the relevance of those points. Yeah, and I think we, we, we uh, appreciate the fact that you've mentioned them again, because I think it needs to hit home. Also, don't forget that DG5 Africa offers free social media training for small businesses through the Boost with Facebook. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I'd like to say thank you very much for your, for your patience and for being so eloquent and just sharing your lived experience and then also your learned experience. I think um, it is valuable um, in a community like this to have this kind of insight. So my panelists were um, uh, Pakamile Schlazo, um, Lebo Pasha, Ilse van Skalkweg, and Opa Pilani. Guys, I can't, I can't, it's been a masterclass, to be honest, and I really, really appreciate the time and the effort. Um, we are running out of time, so I'm going to rush through the next um, couple of minutes. We have a vote of thanks from Nuleka Morsi, who's from Digify Africa. Um, Nuleka, please take it away. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Awesome. To our respected speakers, our most valued guests, the tourism and hospitality entrepreneurs of South Africa who are currently in this live stream right now, um, and also the ones who are watching on our Facebook Live page. Uh, my name is Lula Gamosi. I'm the head of projects at Digify Africa. It is my privilege um, to give a vote of thanks at the end of this incredible but imperative conversation um, for a very much loved industry. And I think I speak for all South Africans, you know, um, about the fact that our heart really breaks, about the fact that we aren't able to relieve our work stresses, take a break, you know, explore the country and even the world um, in the form of travel and hospitality experiences like we actually used to do. Um, so on behalf of Facebook Africa, Digify Africa and the African Management Institute, I'd like to extend a warm vote of thanks to all the speakers for granting us with your presence, for reminding us of the importance of your work and for openly sharing your insights and findings with us today. It's been a robust and fruitful conversation and I don't think it actually ends here. Um, I would like to thank all of our guests who joined in the Zoom call, our keynote guest speakers, Nomonde Gongleka Siopa and Sisan Jona. Thank you so, so much. Our panelists, Pagami Lesha Azo, Lebu Pasha, Elsa van Skalkveig, and Opa Pilane. Your wealth of knowledge of information and solutions is absolutely paramount. Thank you to our MC and host, Sam Marshall. Thank you for moderating and carrying this conversation so beautifully. Um, this afternoon. I just want to thank you all for just your vigor and the excitement because I think you guys were so ready for this conversation. And I think it was very fruitful. And I, as I said, it does not absolutely end here. And I hope that the guests, the attendees who are in the room, you're going to be leaving here inspired, hopeful, ready to take charge of the narrative of your businesses um, post this actual event. To so our guests who are watching on the Facebook Live, we thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to engage with us. Um, on this very important topic. Um, we hope that the conversation today, you know, does not really stop here. It continues in your own spaces, your own meetings, your own communities, and even across the borders. Um, so we would like to just invite you all to um, the Great Horizon Strategic Learning Session next week, Wednesday, from 11 to half past one. AMI will be facilitating a business survival toolkit workshop um, that will assist you in future scenarios as well as cash flow planning. Digify Africa will also be hosting a boost with Facebook free training as well on how to build an effective advertising strategy. So I just like to thank you for staying with us right until the very end. Um, it's been an honor to actually watch this and to actually bring you this event um, today called Great Horizons. And we look forward to those Great Horizons. So from me, stay safe, stay warm, <laughs> and stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Leleka. And then um, don't forget, we are giving away five of those $100 vouchers uh, through the Facebook training program. You will be notified in due course. Uh, there wasn't a competition criteria. It was really uh, um, related to your, um, your involvement in today's discussion. So if you commented a lot, you're definitely going to get something from us. 
or if you engaged a lot with us. I'm going to say goodbye. It has been um, quite an interesting experience because um, as Luleka was saying, and a lot of the speakers that we are currently living through a very strange time in South Africa. So it's going to take big hearts, big minds, um, a willingness to go the extra mile. But I do believe that all of us have the potential to help to rebuild South Africa. And that's what we're going to need. We end off this with an experiential segment. It's called Swing Jump by Dignify Africa. From Issa Marshall, from the entire team that's been involved um, from AMI and Digify Africa. Thank you. Be safe. Get vaccinated. Hi, Sam. Um, I think uh, our jumper, I think she's still here. She, she's gotten cold feet because it's quite, it's quite a, a scary jump. So um, she's decided <laughs> she needs to Go gather her herself Take and the gather place. the courage. <laughs> so she is not going to do the jump, but I'm going to sort of show how, how deep this gorge is. Um, I hope you can see it uh all the way from the lift so i do not blame her i think it is quite scary um but this is what the actual gorge looks like oh wow i think i've i've now bailed out our our jumper i think that, <laughs> that view is enough to bail her there, there, is, there is something else actually i know the best way to bail myself out out of that <laughs> Um, I actually have the names of all the competition uh, winners. So I think that that counts for something, right? Um, so we have the names of the five people that will be receiving $100 vouchers um, for Facebook credits. So you'll be able to actually go online and run yourself some adverts um, or Facebook and Instagram as well. And the winners that are, it is U Nomzamo Entile. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. We also have Denise Reed Daly. Um, the third one is Dennis, uh, is it Goffinev? I hope I'm saying your surname correctly. Uh, also Stefan Enrich. And the last one is Terry Marsh. We do have your details. So we will send you an email um, with the voucher that you can use to advertise your small business on Facebook. Fantastic. Okay, guys. So there we've got our, our five winners. It's been a fantastic session. Here's the other beautiful thing, though. Now that you know who Namondo is, Pakamile, Ilsa, Opa, and Lebu, please feel free to find them online, send them the questions, engage with them. It's not going to cost you anything. You'll be surprised. They might be a little bit busy, but they will respond. And there's a ton of resources that's available for you. And, and remember, it's free. Some of it, not all of it. It's free. So use it, save your business, protect the livelihoods, and make sure that at the end of this pandemic, you still have a business that you can call a business. So from us, have a, have a fantastic Wednesday. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, guys.